Brutal truth number one, many doctors quit. Why do you think you're any different? I'm a doctor, an anesthesiology resident in New York City, and 10 years ago, I started my pre-med journey at UCLA. Today, I help thousands of pre-meds get into their dream med schools, and I do it primarily by being brutally honest. So here are 10 brutal truth cheat codes that I wish someone told me when I was pre-med. Kevin Jabal, Ali Abdal, Zach Hiley, Dr. Gooby, the neurosurgeon, they all left medicine. Decades ago, people thought, why wouldn't you become a doctor? And today, people say, why would you ever become a doctor? So know what you're getting yourself into. This decision is hard to reverse. It's seven to 12 years of training, each with 60 to 80 hour work weeks. And the people who do leave medicine for whatever reason, from administrative creep to feeling like they're not making a difference to losing their autonomy and feeling like they're a cog in the larger machine, they're not crazy people. Those are real reasons. And to be clear, I love being a doctor and I don't see myself quitting anytime soon, but you're insane if you think it's a perfect job. It's not right for everyone. Dan Pink talks about the three key elements that make a fulfilling career, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Today, take some time to grade medicine against those three criteria and do it for all of your alternatives too, because you don't wanna be doing this math at 3 a.m. when you're on an overnight call shift, 39 years old, $300,000 in debt, wondering where you went wrong. And yes, it's important to think about this even before you apply. I know we're all worried about getting into medical school, but we need to figure out why we're doing all this in the first place. If your attention is still just fixed on getting into medical school, I don't blame you. It's a stressful process. To help, we have eight full AMCAS applications that earned acceptances to some of the best programs in the country. Join our premium community of near 21,000 strong by clicking the application database link in our description box below now. Brutally honest truth number two, necessary but not enough. It's no secret that medical school admissions is unbelievably competitive. And what that physically means is that every individual part of your application is necessary, but not enough. You work hard, great, so does everyone else. That's not enough. You have a great GPA, awesome. Over the last three years, more than 12,000 pre-meds had near perfect stats. Stats will get your foot in the door, but it won't earn you a seat at the table. You need everything. The GPA, the MCAT, the extracurriculars, the letters of recommendations, the school list, and the written application, all of it in harmony, unified, coherent, to give you a chance at some of the best programs in the country. And while I found it scary when I was a pre-med, I actually now think that this is a win-win situation. You build a competitive application, and along the way, you find that you've become a better person and professional. Med school admissions, in its own sick, twisted way, is a fantastic vehicle for your own growth and your own self-actualization. And some people may think that's mental jujitsu, but I think it's this attention to detail that really separates pre-meds who get into medical school from those who don't. If you're applying to medical school in the coming year or two, you don't want to make the wrong decision. Our pre-med Catalyst students that submit their applications on time have a 100% acceptance rate, and that's more than double the national average. Our results are only because we work so closely with students. In fact, we can only take on four students per month until we're full for the cycle. So if you'd be interested in getting into some of the strongest programs in the country, click the application cycle advising link down below to book a free strategy call before we're full. Really honest truth number three, become the only one. Steve earned a full ride scholarship to a top six medical school. And his main extracurricular is that he started as a TA for people in the justice system. And then he spent a year leading the students to earn credits towards their associate's degree. And then in his next gap year, he ascended again and became the prison's first intern. He started and maintained a computer lab so that people doing their time could then use that time towards building real credentials and real skills that would land them real jobs when they left prison. And when I tell that story, it sounds incredible, but it also sounds doable. It has commonalities to things we know and may have on our own resumes. For example, many of us are TAs or learning assistants in some way, but he made his own unique impact in his own unique population. Being a TA in that specific environment, working with people in prison, taught him a ton about learners in different corners of the world. And his entire application is actually about what we get wrong about people who are incarcerated. Steve ultimately ended up becoming one of my best friends, and he's now doing an addiction medicine fellowship. So I'd argue that the medical school got it right by investing in him. He showed promise seven years ago, and he continues to flourish. And I haven't met anyone like him since. Brilliant is truth number four being average. 
public service announcement, but getting into medical school is not a normal thing. Most undergrads aren't willing to put up with years of unpaid internships, bogus volunteering opportunities, where you're at the bottom of the totem pole doing absolutely nothing. Maintain your highest grades in your entire campus, and then spend your mornings doing research, spend your evenings in extracurriculars, and then spend your weekends studying for the MCAT. And honestly, undergrads shouldn't. College are supposed to be your golden years, and if they don't want to be a doctor, they're probably the same ones. If you are going to commit to this pre-med journey, there will come a time where you will have to put up an extraordinary effort. Around that time, if people see the amount of effort you're putting in, their only response will be to try and pull you down. Because seeing you work hard reminds them of what they should be doing, but are not. So them and being average. Do your thing if this is what you really want. Brutally Honest Truth number five, 904 635 508. That was my university ID at UCLA, and that's how professors knew me. They passed my grade through that ID, and my in class attendance was recorded through that soulless nine digit number. But you're more than that. You're human with your own interests, passions, identities. You're an athlete. You care about the Vietnamese immigrant community. And when you have free time, you love watching Red Bull YouTube videos. Don't let the educational monolith take that away from you. Don't compromise who you are for two stupid letters at the end of your name. Brilliant on truth number six, focus on the ingredients and the cooking will take care of itself. When it's time to write your personal statement or your work and activities, everyone starts with their lived experiences, their extracurriculars. These are the ingredients, the base, each of us have to work with. And yes, there are ways to optimize your writing from the 20-40-40 RIR responsibilities, impact and reflection framework that we teach, or the overarching principle that ad comms don't read, they skim your application. And so your writing has to be, say, seventh grade max reading level, has to be straightforward and clear. Those are very important, but far too many pre-meds forget that they have years before it's time to submit their application. And the best thing they can do for their application today is to improve the quality of the ingredients that they work with. I'll give you an extreme example. It's impossible to write a application if for the last couple of years, you're an Olympic athlete, you publish research in a high impact journal, you start an infectious disease screening program that partners with the Department of Health. You could write that application in Japanese and it would still get it. Brutally honest truth number seven, power follows the finger. When I was at UCLA, I felt like a lot of things were unfair. Some students had personal tutors. Some of my colleagues had to work evening shifts to pay for their loans. I often pointed the finger elsewhere to displace the blame. I realized quickly that that never helped anybody. If anything, it just made me feel like they were the enemy, and yet I was still here, sitting in the same place. So today, I've come to realize that everything truly is my fault. I take full ownership for where I'm at and where I'm going. Because if it's in my control, I have to take responsibility. And if it's not in my control, it's best not worry about it. Brutally honest truth, number eight. Odysseus and the pre-med sirens. There will come a time in your pre-med odyssey when you will be tempted by the sirens. It might be to start a nonprofit or to do 2,000 more hours of being an EMT because those things are sexier and fancier and cooler than doing what you know you need to do. Cover up your red flags. Like let's say you're 505 on the MCAT when you have the goal of going to Harvard. It's easier to just take 24 more units because you've always done well in school than it is to become a better professional. Because it's hard to become more prepared for lab meetings, impress your PI with extra work on the weekends because research is all new to you. We do more of what we're comfortable with, even if we know that doing more of that isn't getting us to where we need to be. We behave with emotion, not logic. So to move forward, you're going to have to stay in the driver's seat, strap yourself in, put in the earplugs, and continue forward with what you know you need to do, even if you might not want to do it and you're distracted by all the other opportunities around you. Brutally honest truth, number nine. This is as good as it's going to get. I thought the MCAT was hard until I took step one. I thought step one was hard until I did my first 24 hour shift. I thought my first 24 hour shift was hard until my first patient died on the table. This is as good as it's ever going to get. Your journey always gets harder. You just get stronger. Brutally honest truth, number 10. There's nothing new under the sun. Every single year, 20,000 pre-meds earn a white coat. And those pre-meds have gone through every single obstacle you have gone through and you will go through. They've already made the mistakes. I've already made the mistakes. 
And over the last seven years advising thousands of pre-meds, I have seen every single mistake repeated again and again. So learn the lessons without the scar. That's what we're here for. If you like this video, you'll love this one here, where I share 10 hard truths that I wish I knew when I was a pre-med. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.